Gajak and Felix, Volume 1, Troll Slayer, by William King Part 3, The Dark Beneath the World After the dire events at Fort Von Deal, we set off with heavy hearts towards the mountains and Karak Eight Peaks. It was a long, hard journey, one not made any easier by the wildness of the country that we passed through. The hunger, the hardships, and the constant threat of marauding greenskins did little to improve my state of mind, and it may be that I was perhaps particularly susceptible when I first looked on the fading grandeur of that ancient ruined city of the dwarves, lost amid those distant peaks for all those long ages. In any case, I now recall that I had a terrible sense of foreboding about what we would find there and, as was usually the case, my fears proved to be amply justified. From My Travels with Gotrek, Volume 2, by Herr Felix Jaeger, Altorf Press, 2505. A scream echoed through the cold mountain air. Felix Jaeger ripped his sword from its scabbard and stood ready. Snowflakes fell. A chill wind stirred his long blonde hair. He threw his red woolen cloak back over his shoulder, leaving his sword arm unobstructed. The bleak landscape was a perfect site for an ambush, pitted and rocky, harsher than the surface of the greater moon, Mansleib. He glanced left, up slope. A few stunted pines clutched the mountainside with gnarled roots. Down slope, to the right, lay an almost sheer drop. Neither direction held any sign of danger. No bandits, no orcs, none of the darker things that lurked in these remote mountains. The noise came from up ahead, Manling, Gotrek Gurnison said, rubbing his eye patch with one huge, tattooed hand. His nose chain jingled in the breeze. There's a fight going on up there. Uncertainty filled Felix. He knew Gotrek was correct. Even with one eye, the dwarf senses were keener than his own. The question was whether to stand and wait, or push forward and investigate. Potential enemies filled the World's Edge Mountains. The chances of finding friends were slim. His natural caution inclined him towards doing nothing. Gotrek charged up the scree-screwn path, enormous axe held high above his red-dyed crest of hair. Felix cursed. For once, why couldn't Gotrek remember that not everyone was a troll slayer? We didn't all swear to seek out death in combat, he muttered, before following slowly, for he lacked the dwarf's sure-footedness over this treacherous terrain. Felix took in the scene of carnage with one swift glance. In the long depression, a gang of hideous, green-skinned orcs battled a small group of men. They fought across a vast flowing stream which ran down the little valley, before disappearing over the mountain edge in a cloud of silver spray. The waters ran red with the blood of men and horses. It was easy to imagine what had happened, an ambush as the humans were crossing the water. In midstream, a huge man in shiny plate mail battled with three brawny, bow-legged assailants. Wielding his two-handed blade effortlessly, he feinted a blow to his left, then beheaded a different foe with one mighty swing. The force of the blow almost overbalanced him. Felix realized the stream bed must be slippery. On the nearer bank, a man in dark brocaded robes chanted a spell. A ball of fire blazed in his left hand. A dark-haired warrior in the furred and deerskin tunic of a trapper protected a sorcerer from two screaming orcs, using only a longsword held in his left hand. As Felix was watching, a blonde man-at-arms fell, trying to hold in entrails released by a scimitar slash to the stomach. As he went down, burly, half-naked savages hacked him to pieces. Only three of the ambushed party now stood, and they were outnumbered five to one. Orcish filth! You dare to soil the sacred approach to Karak Eight Peaks? Uruk Mortari, prepare to die! Gotrek screamed, charging down into the melee. An enormous orc turned to face him. A look of surprise froze forever on its face as Gotrek lopped off its head with one mighty blow. Ruby blood spattered the Trollslayer's tattooed body. 
Raving and snarling, the dwarf plowed into the orcs, heaving left and right in a great double arc. Dead bodies lay everywhere his axe fell. Felix half ran, half slid down the scree. He fell at the bottom. Wet grass tickled his nostrils. He rolled to one side as a scimitar-wielding monster half again his bulk chopped down at him. He sprang to his feet, ducked a cut that would have chopped him in two, and lopped off an earlobe with his return blow. Startled, the orc clutched at the wound, trying to stop the blood flowing down its face. Felix seized the chance and stabbed upwards through the bottom of the creature's jaw into the brain. As he struggled to free the blade, another monster leapt at him, swinging its scimitar high over its head. Felix let go of the weapon and moved to meet the attacker. He grabbed its wrists as he was overborne. Fetid breath made him gag as the orc fell on top of him. The thing dropped its weapon and they wrestled on the ground, rolling down into the stream. Copper rings set in the orc's flesh scraped him as the thing sought to bite his throat with its sharp teeth. Felix arrived to avoid having his windpipe torn out. The orc pushed his head underwater. Felix looked up through stinging eyes and saw the strangely distorted face leering down at him. Bitterly cold water filled his mouth. There was no air in his lungs. Frantically, he shifted his weight, trying to dislodge the attacker. They rolled, and suddenly Felix was astride the orc, trying to push its head under the stream in turn. The orc grabbed his wrists and pushed. Locked in a deadly embrace, they began to roll through the freezing water. Again and again Felix's head went under. Again and again he floundered, gasping to the surface. Sharp rocks speared his flesh. Realization of his peril flashed through his mind, as the current and their own momentum carried them towards the cliff edge. Felix tried to break free, giving up all thoughts of drowning his opponent. When next his head broke surface, he looked for the cloud of spray. To his horror, it was only a dozen paces away. He redoubled his efforts to escape, but the orc held on him like grim death, and they continued their downward tumble. Maybe ten feet now. Felix heard the rumble of the fall, felt the distorted currents of the turbulent water. He drew back his fist and smashed the orc in the face. One of its tusks broke out, but it would not let go. Five feet to go. He lashed out once more, bouncing the orc's head off the stream bottom. Its grip loosened, and he was almost free. Suddenly he was falling, tumbling through the water and air. He frantically grabbed for something, anything, to hold. His hand smashed into the rock, and he struggled for a grip on the slippery stream bed. The pressure of the freezing water on his head and shoulders was almost intolerable. He risked a downwards look. A long way below, he saw the valleys in the foothills. So great was the drop that copses of trees looked like blotches of mold on the landscape. The falling orc was a receding, screaming, greenish form. With the last of his strength, Felix flopped over the edge, pushing against the current with cold, numbed fingers. For a second, he thought he wasn't going to make it. Then he was face down on the edge of the stream, gasping in bubbling water. He crawled out onto the bank. The orcs, their leaders dead, had been routed. Felix pulled off his sodden cloak, wondering whether he was going to catch a chill from the frigid mountain air. Boys, Sigmar, that was well done. We were sore pressed there, the tall, dark-haired man said. He made the sign of the hammer over his chest as he spoke. He was handsome in a coarse way. His armor, although dented, was of the finest quality. The intensity of his stare made Felix uneasy. It would seem that we owe you gentlemen our lives, the sorcerer said. He too was richly dressed. His brocaded robes were trimmed with gold thread. Scrolls covered in mystical symbols were held by rings set in it. His long blonde hair was cut in a peculiar fashion. From the center of his flowing locks rose a crest not unlike Gotrex, save for the fact that it was undyed and cropped short. Felix wondered if it was the mark of some mystical order. The armored man's laughter boomed out. It is the prophecy, Johann. 
Did not the God say one of our ancient brethren would aid us? Sigmar be praised. This is a good sign indeed. Felix looked over at the trapper. He spread his hands and shrugged helplessly. A certain cynical humor was apparent in the way he raised an eyebrow. I am Felix Jaeger of Altdorf, and this is my companion Gotrek Gernison, the troll slayer. Felix said, bowing to the knight. I am Aldred Kepler, known as the Fellblade, Templar Knight of the Order of the Fiery Heart, the armored man said. Felix suppressed a shudder. In his homeland of the Empire, this order was famed for the fanatic zeal with which they pursued their crusade against the goblin races, and those humans they considered heretics. The knight gestured to the sorcerer. This is my advisor on things magical, Dr. Johann Zauberlich of the University of Nuln. At your service, Zauberlich said, bowing. I am Jules Gascoigne, once of Quenel in Bretonia, although that was many a year ago, the fur-clad man said. He had a Bretonian accent. Her Gascoigne is a scout. I engaged him to guide us through these mountains, Aldred said. I have a great work to perform at Karak Eight Peaks. Felix and Gotrek exchanged glances. Felix knew that the dwarf would rather they traveled alone in search of lost treasure of the ancient dwarf city. However, parting company from their chance-met companions would only arouse suspicion. Perhaps we should join forces, Felix said, hoping that Gotrek would follow his line of reasoning. We too are bound for the city of the Eight Peaks, and this road is far from safe. A capital suggestion, the sorcerer said. Doubtless your companion, he goes to visit his kin, Jules said, oblivious to the dagger stare Gotra gave him. There is still a small outpost of imperial dwarfs there. We had best bury your companions, Felix said to fill the silence. Why so glum, friend Felix? Is it not a lovely night? Jules Gascoigne asked sardonically, blowing on his hands to warm them against the bitter cold. Felix pulled his spare cloak over his knees and extended his hands towards the small fire that Zauberlich had lit with a muttered word of power. He looked over at the Bretonian, his face turned into a demonic mask by the firelight. These mountains are chill and daunting, Felix said. Who knows what perils they hide? Who indeed? We are close to the Darklands. Some say this is the very spawning ground of orcs and all other greenskin devils. Also, I have heard tales that these mountains are haunted. Felix gestured towards the fire. Do you think we should have lit this? From nearby came Gotrek's reassuring snores and the regular rhythmic breathing of the others. Jules chuckled. It is a choice between evils, no? I have seen men freeze to death on nights like this. If anything attacks us, it is best we have light to see by. The greenskins may be able to spot a man in the dark, but we cannot, eh? No, I do not think the fire makes much difference. However, I do not think this is why you are sad. He looked at Felix expectantly. Without really knowing why, Felix told him the entire story of how he and Gotrek had joined the Von Deel expedition to the border princes. Von Deel and his retainers had sought peace in a new land, and only found terrible death. He told of his meeting with his beloved Kirsten. The Bretonian listened sympathetically. When Felix finished telling his story, Jules shook his head. Ah, it is a sorry world we live in, is it not? It is indeed. Do not dwell on the past, my friend. It cannot be altered. In time all wounds heal. It doesn't seem that way to me. Then they fell into silence. Felix looked over at the sleeping dwarf. Godrek sat like a gargoyle, immobile, eyes shut, but axe in hand. Felix wondered how the dwarf would take the scout's advice. Godrek, like all the dwarves, constantly brooded on the lessons of the past. His sense of history drove him inexorably towards the future. He claimed that men had imperfect memories, but the dwarves were better. Is that why he seeks his doom? Felix wondered. 
Does his shame burn in him as strong now as at the moment he committed whatever crime he seeks to atone for? Felix pondered upon what it must be like to live with the past intruding so strongly into the present that it can never be forgotten. I would go mad, he decided. He inspected his own grief and tried to recall it anew minted. It seemed that it had diminished by a particle, had been eroded by time, and would continue to be so. He felt no better, knowing that he was doomed to forget, to have his memories become pale shadows. Perhaps the dwarf's way was better, he thought. Even the time he had spent with Kirsten seemed paler, more colorless. During his watch, Felix thought he saw a greenish witch-light high up the mountain above them. As he stared, he felt a sense of dread. The light drifted about as if seeking something. In its midst was a vaguely human form. Felix had heard tales of the demons haunting these mountains. He looked over at Gotrek, wondering whether he should awake him. The light vanished. Felix watched for a long time, but he saw no other sign. Perhaps it had been an afterimage of the fire, or a trick of the light and a tired mind. Somehow, though, he doubted it. In the morning, he dismissed his suspicions. The party followed the road round the shoulder of the mountain, and suddenly a new land lay spread out before them, under the steel gray sky. They looked down into a long valley nestled in a basin between eight mountains. The peaks rose like the talons of a giant claw. In their palm lay a city. Huge walls blocked the valley entrance, built from blocks of stone taller than a man. Within the walls, next to a silver lake, sat a great keep. A town nestled beneath it. Long roads ran from the fortress to lesser towers at the base of the mountains. Dry stone dikes crisscrossed the valley, creating a patchwork of overgrown fields. Gotrek nudged Felix in the ribs and pointed towards the peaks. Behold, he said, a hint of wonder in his voice. Karag Zilfin, Karag Yar, Karag Monar, and the Silver Horn. Those are the eastern mountains, Aldred said. Karag Lun, Karag Rin, Karag Nar, and the White Lady guard the western approach. Gotrek looked at the Sigmarite respectfully. You speak truthfully, Templar. Long have these mountains haunted my dreams. Long have I wished to stand in their shadow. Felix looked down on the city. There was a sense of enduring power about the place. Karak Eight Peaks had been built from the bones of the mountains to endure until the end of the world. It is truly beautiful, he said. Gotrek looked at him with fierce pride. In ancient times, this city was known as the Queen of the Silver Depths. It was the fairest of our realms, and we grieved when it fell most sorely. But how could it have fallen? All the armies of all the kings of men could be stood off in these mountains. Those fields could feed the population of Quenel. Gotrek shook his head and stared down into the city as intensely as if he were staring back into the elder days. It was in pride that we built the eight pigs, at the zenith of our ancient power. It was a wonder to the world, more beautiful than ever peak, open to the sky. A sign of our wealth and power, strong beyond the measure of dwarves or elves or men. We thought it would never fall, and the mines it guarded would be ours forever. The troll slayer spoke with a bitter, compelling passion that Felix had rarely heard in his voice before. What fools we were, Gotrek said. What fools we were. In pride we built eight peaks, sure of our mastery of stone and the dark beneath the world. Yet even as we built the city, the seeds of its doom were planted. What happened? Felix said. Our quarrel with the elves began. We scourged them from the forests and drove them from the lands. After that, who were we to trade with? Commerce between our races had been a source of very much wealth, tainted though it was. Worse, the cost in lives was more grievous than the cost to our merchants. The finest warriors of three generations fell in that bitter struggle. 
Still, your folk now controlled all the land between the World's Edge Mountains and the Great Sea, Zauberlick said with a pedant smugness. So claims Zipson in his book Wars of the Ancients. The acid of Gotrek's laughter could have corroded steel. Did we? I doubt it. While we had warred with our faithless allies, the dark gathered its power. We were weary of war when the black mountains belched forth their clouds of ash. The sky was overcast, and the sun hid its face. Our crops died, and our cattle sickened. Our people had returned to the safety of their cities, and from the very heart of our realm, from the place we imagined ourselves strongest, our foes burst forth. He stopped speaking, and in the silence, Felix imagined he heard the call of a distant bird. From the tunnels far below any we had ever dug, our enemies struck into the core of our fortresses. Through mines which had been the source of our wealth, poured armies of goblins and rat-like skaven, and things far worse. What did your people do? Felix asked. Gotrek spread wide his arms and looked into their faces. What else could we do? We took up our weapons, and again we went to war. And a terrible war it was. Our battles with the elves had taken place under the sky, through field and forest. The new war was fought in the cramped spaces of the long dark, with dreadful weapons and a ferocity beyond your imagining. Shafts were collapsed, corridors scoured with fire throwers, pits were flooded. Our foes responded with poison gas and vile sorcery and the summoning of demons. Beneath where we now stand, we fought with every resource we could muster, with all our weapons and all the courage desperation brings. We fought and we lost. Step by step we were driven from our home. Felix looked down at a placid city. It seemed impossible that what Gotrek was describing could ever have happened. And yet there was something in the Troll Slayer's voice that compelled belief. Felix imagined that desperate struggle of those long-ago dwarfs, their fear and bewilderment as they were pushed from the place that they had believed was theirs. He pictured them fighting their doomed struggle with more than human tenacity. In the end, it became obvious that we could not hold the city, and so the tombs of our kings and the treasure vaults were sealed and hidden by cunning devices. We abandoned this place to our foes. Gotrek glared at them. Since then we have not been so foolish as to believe any place is secure from the dark. All through the long day, as they approached the wall, Felix realized how much of the old structures had suffered. What from a distance gave the impression of ageless power and sureness, became, on closer inspection, just as ruined as the road upon which they traveled. The curtain wall blocking the road into the valley was four times as tall as a man, and passed between steep, sheer cliffs. Signs of neglect were obvious. Moss grew between the cracks of the great stone blocks. The stones were pitted by rain channels and mottled by yellow lichen. Some were blackened as if by great swathes of fire. A huge section of the wall had tumbled away. The companions were silent. The desolation cast a pall over the entire party. Felix felt depressed and on edge. It was as if the spirits of antiquity watched over them, brooding over the tumbled remains of the ancient grandeur. Felix's hand never stayed far away from the hilt of his sword. The cracked valves of the ancient gate had been wedged open. Someone had made a half-hearted attempt to clear the sign of the hammer and crown over eight peaks carved into the stone. Already the lichen was growing back in place. Someone has been here recently, Jules said, studying the gates closely. I can see how you earned your reputation as a scout, Gotrek said sarcastically. Stay where you are, boomed out an unfamiliar voice. Unless you want to be filled with crossbow bolts. Felix looked up at the parapet. He saw the helmeted heads of a dozen dwarves looking down through the battlements. Each one pointed a loaded crossbow at them. Welcome to Karak Eight Peaks, their grey-bearded leader said. 
I hope you have good reason for trespassing on the domain of Prince Belegar.